This is Culture Cast. I'm Nova Safo. Today, our special holiday episode, Christmas Foods from Christmas Songs. I remember hearing this as a child. It comes like, a, it's a couple of verses in, it's like soft, doughy, fruity, spiced dessert. That's Culture Cast, coming up. Culture Cast is a production of Chicago Radio Works. You can subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or the TuneIn app. You can also listen on our website, culturecast.org. Welcome to Culture Cast. I'm Nova Safo in Chicago. Ah, yes, Christmas is here, and so are the many, many Christmas songs. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Everywhere you go. But have you heard the foods mentioned in the lyrics? Listening once again with candy canes and silver lanes aglow. Candy canes in this classic tune, and that's where we start off today's show, looking at the Christmas foods from Christmas songs and their cultural significance. Our guide is Culture Cast's food editor, Sasha Woodruff. There are actually a lot of myths about where candy canes come from. The first one goes that there was this candy maker in Indiana, and he wanted a candy that symbolized the blood and the purity of Christ. So he took, you know, already existing hard candy sticks, and then he put a red stripe around them to symbolize the blood of Christ. And then he hooked it into like a crook, symbolizing the shepherds that who visited Jesus when he was born. That's really gross. Uh, There's... (laughs) That's really Uh, gross and doesn't sound very family-friendly, frankly. Probably not. The other one is uh, there was a choir director in Cologne, Germany in the late 1600s, and he was sitting around trying to figure out how to make children sit still for, for these probably very long practices. And he didn't think parents would really buy into having them suck on candy all day, so he decided to come up with kind of a ruse as to why they... Um, should have these candies. And so he invented these candies and he put again a red stripe around it and did the crook to symbolize the shepherds. It's sort of the same story, but uh, the shepherd's crook who came to visit baby Jesus in Bethlehem when he was born. And then he figured that would be, you know, he would get parental buy-in for Mm -hmm. these candies. So uh, here's the problem with these uh, tales, Sasha. The first one doesn't sound very Midwestern to me in terms of Midwestern ethic. And the second one, if anyone has spent any time at Sunday church, they will tell you, I don't think most church choir directors are that inventive. So how realistic are these stories? Well, you know what? They're actually not at all. There's no evidence that they are true. The only evidence we have about the origins of the striped candies is we do have striped candies going back to like 1844. The first evidence of a hooked candy starts We start to see those around the early 1900s on Christmas cards. Maybe they were easier to hang on trees. Who knows? There is the one concrete evidence of their popularity nowadays is that there was a candy maker in Georgia in 1919, and he started to make these candies for local sales. The problem was is that when he would make them, they would break off a lot for when they would bend the candy. Mm. And so they would lose a lot in the, in the production. So later this company came up with an automated process to bend the sticks and then it made them easier to produce and then mass produce. And then I think that's part of the reason that we see them everywhere is because of this candy machine invention. Okay. So lots of myths, very few concrete facts, but it looks like we have some sense that maybe they were really an invention of the late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, as we see a lot of things in Christmas traditions that are adapted from pagan traditions, and they were adapted to the Christian story, you know, the Christmas tree was something that was done for a coming of winter festival. So I think a lot of these things that we attribute to, you know, Christianity and Christmas, they actually, you know, probably had nothing to do with, you know, the original birth story of Jesus. All right. So here's our second song. So this is a little bit of a less well-known one, but it's pretty popular. I mean, I think a lot of people can whistle the tune even if they can't say the words, but here we come, a wassailing. What the heck is wassailing? What is wassail? Wassailing, wassailing. 
Did I pronounce it wrong? Yeah, you did. But that's okay. Super awkward. This is how little we know about this. So I don't even know how to pronounce it. So what the heck is it? So it's um, it's a hot, warm spice drink. I mean, if you think about like mulled wines, glue vine that we drink around this time, I mean, warm drinks are something that we drink because it's winter. But I actually didn't know about what wassailing was. And it turns out it's another Anglo-Saxon tradition where people would go door to door. What a surprise. Yeah. Again, this is sort of like the Halloween stuff where people would go door to door and they would offer this hot drink and Uh. they would sing. And then people would get gifts for this in exchange. So you have these gangs of people with a spiced apple drink and you, you go up to people's doors and you sing and then you... You apparently get gifts for that. Now, is this an alcoholic drink or a children-friendly drink? It's a children-friendly drink. You can do it with like cloves and allspice and ginger and then um, apple cider. And you can also put in like some orange juice and some lemon juice. I do have a recipe that you can look at on the website. Here's the other really interesting thing about this. There's another kind of wassailing, and that's when people would actually go into orchards in the winter and they would sing and say incantations to assure a good harvest in the coming year. So that's another form of wassailing. And that was just to... That sounds um, a little pagan to me. It Again, a little pagan, but asking for a good harvest during mm, the winter. There so, we go. It keeps creeping yeah. in. It shows up a lot yeah. in, in a lot of Christmas traditions. All right. Here's the last song we're going to play. All right, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Everybody knows that one. But what we don't know is that there's figgy pudding mentioned in it. I didn't even know this. Yeah, so I remember hearing this as a child. It comes like a, it's a couple of verses in. So puddings in Brit, in the British kitchen are kind of a staple. Mm. As is British food. You know, I'm, or, I'm already pudding. thinking it's probably not good. Yeah, it's it's some sort of steamed haggis or something. Oh, no, no, gross. no. Um, it, <laughs> actually, it, it is. It's, it's a sweet dessert pudding. Now, it's not a pudding that you think of with like milk and you know vanilla that you buy like maybe in the mm-hmm. store. That it's kind of like a creamy thing. No, this is actually done with like flour and eggs and butter, and it is spiced with figs or plums, and it's steamed. You put you have a container and you in it's closed off and you steam it for like a couple hours. And then it comes out with this kind of like soft, doughy, fruity, spiced dessert. And you can eat it with like a hard sauce or a rum sauce. It's actually pretty. I I actually quite enjoy them. Mm. So, Sasha, I'm going to break from our little uh, pattern here about food from Christmas songs and ask you about something. I really just want to get real here. Uh, You ready? Yeah. All right. Here we go. What the heck is up with fruitcake? (laughs) <laughs> okay, so I have some theories about fruitcake. So I think the thing that people are so disgusted with fruitcake are the like the maraschino cherries that they yeah. put in, which are like these disgusting candy, like either bright red or bright green. And like there's this candied fruit that's in it. And, it, you know, the cake mm-hmm. is not bad. You know, it's like a basic quick bread, like, a, you know, you, you can it's a decent cake. It's just the fruit that they put in is is really awful. Yeah. And why it's like, why do that to a perfectly fine fruit so um (laughs) and cake (laughs) so the original maraschino cherries are actually from italy and they were like these really boozy cherries Ah. and so they were done in alcohol but then during prohibition that makes a lot more sense yeah they you know these cherries were basically outlawed because you could get drunk off of them Mm -hmm. and so some company invented this this very chemically cherry to replace the maraschino the you know the original maraschino cherry and then i Uh think it just stuck around and then I think mostly because people, once you eat it, you can't digest it. <laughs> right. I mean, and I, I think I, I don't think you do digest it. Um, so I think if you take a good fruitcake recipe and just replace it with like a rum cherry or some other kind of alcoholic cherry or some dried fruit, I think there it will be a lot less offensive. So people might actually like fruitcake again. I think we could make fruitcake come back. I really do. Wow. Yeah. It's the next muffin. It's going to be the next cronut. <laughs> You know, you mentioned rum cherries. Are there other things you think would work particularly well in, in a fruitcake? Well, I think if you maybe soaked some raisins in rum or you could do like dried apricots or um, just any kind of fruit that hasn't gone through this chemical process that makes you feel like Monsanto has done something with it. <laughs> 
All right. Well, Sasha, this all has been fascinating as always. Thank you so much for spending a few minutes with us. Thank you. CultureCast food editor Sasha Woodruff joining us from Los Angeles. And that's CultureCast for this week and this year. From Sasha and me and everyone who makes CultureCast possible, happy holidays and a very happy new year. We hope you'll join us on the flip side and we can remind you, just subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or tune in. Search for CultureCast from Chicago Radio Works. I'm Nova Safo in Chicago. Thanks for listening.